We spoke a little bit about the quantitative analysis workflow, the workflow that takes place on the technical side of the project. But if you're going to be doing quantitative consulting, you need to realize that a fair amount of your time will be spent on other tasks, non-technical tasks, administrative tasks. Part of the challenge that you're going to be faced with is the fact that in general, for a reasonably sized project, there's just too many moving parts. You need teams of consultants to work on projects. You think of it as a team sport. Each team member brings something to the table, both in terms of their ability to work with data and quantitative methods, and in terms of context, where they fit in the ecosystem of the client, the project, the team members. There's four roles here. Basically, you have data management, data preparation, analysis, and communications. These are the types of, of uh, technical skills you need to have or technical tasks that need to be achieved. And ideally, no single consultant will be tasked with doing all of those. But at the same time, every consultant should be able, if the need arises, to jump into some of the other slices here. So let's talk about some of the roles. The managers and the team leads are the people who have to understand the process and they have to be able to recognize whether what is being done makes sense, both in terms of the proposal or the agreement and in terms of, well, from a technical basis. And they need to be able to provide realistic estimates of the time and effort required to complete the tasks, both to the clients and to the team members. In a sense here, these managers, and I'm not talking about like, I'm not talking about managers in an organization. I'm talking about the people who will be managing the consulting team. They act as interpreters. They are the go-betweens, the consulting team and the clients. And they should be advocating for the team. If things don't go nearly as well as they should, they should be able to shield the team from the client. In general, if there's going to be somebody communicating from the team to the client, it should be the manager. There should be one point of contact rather than having all team members talking to all team members on the client side. Now, there might be instances where <clears throat> as a consultant, you have, I don't know how to say this in English, a nomologue. Um, somebody who plays a role similar to yours, but on the other side of the, of the client consultant divide. Presumably there'll be some direct communications between these corresponding team members, but official conversations should really go through team manager, the team lead and the project authority on the client side. Now, it's conceivable, of course, that the managers will not be involved with day-to-day -day aspects of the projects, but they're still responsible for the project delivery. You should have consultants on your team who are database specialists. They work with the client, they work with IT internally, and there are the people who will help you make sure that the data sources can actually be used by the consulting team. The client has data, the client has data, the client has data. It might not be readily available in the format which is usable by the consulting team. So your database specialists will be the people that are going to smooth out the process so that the team can actually work and use data to do what they're supposed to be doing. It would be recommended that there isn't like a hard divide between people who just take care of the databases and people who just take care of the analysis. You want people who run the analyses to have an understanding as to how the data is collected or how it's available, and you don't want your database 
people to just be database people, right? They should know what it is that you intend to do with it. That's going to inform the way in which they prepare the data to make it available to the team. Your technical specialists, these would be the people who work with the process data to build the models that will eventually lead to actionable insights. Now, we're talking about people who should have a sound understanding of algorithms, quantitative methods in general, and how you can apply them to a bunch of uh, scenarios. Ideally, these are not people who are only experts in one area. So, oh, I can only do time series analysis. It's like, no. Time series analysis, data visualization, machine learning. Perhaps time series analysis, data cleaning, outlier analysis, and queuing models. If they're not going to be full experts, more than one area, they have to be the types of people who can catch up on new material quickly. Shouldn't take them forever to learn enough of a new method that they can become useful. Communication specialists, these would be the team members who can actually convey the actionable insights that the analysis has provided into a format that the managers, the policy analysts, the stakeholders in general can understand and act on. So your communication specialists, they can participate in the analysis. In fact, they should, but they don't necessarily specialize in like very fancy methods fancy algorithms. They should be able to basically have a general idea as to what's happening in the workflow. And they should be able to keep on top of popular accounts of quantitative results, which means they need to do a lot of reading and recognizing how results of a quantitative nature are conveyed to the public. Now I showed you a picture a little while back of a team interacting, a team meeting. There's no way to get around it. Quantitative consulting is stressful. In an academic environment, you are used to stress, right? At school, the pace typically tends to be looser or slower, but you still have deadlines. You still have to write exams. You still have to hand in assignments or finish your theses. Um, and work in pilot like you might have multiple courses you might have teaching duties you might have ta duties you might be doing a bunch of stuff outside of work as well that requires a, a fair amount of your time and mental energy you know about stress uh, but if you're going to be doing consulting there's two additional stressors the first one is that you only have three potential grades. You can get the equivalent of an A plus if you've exceeded the client expectations. And if you just met the expectation, which is still significant, that's about the equivalent of an A minus. Completely acceptable. Not as great as an A plus, but you know, you can get by on a bunch of A minuses. And then there's only one other grade you didn't meet the expectations. And if you didn't meet the expectations, it doesn't really matter by how much you missed meeting the expectations, you get the equivalent of an F. Some projects are gonna bomb. That's just the reality of the situation. They can bomb for a variety of reasons. Sometimes you have no control over any of these reasons. There's an added element. Project quality, crucial. But so is timeliness. If you miss a deadline, that could turn out to be very, very damaging from a professional perspective. Perhaps just as damaging if you gave in flawed work or turned in uninspired work. Even if your work is perfect, if you deliver it late, it might still cost you a fair amount of money. Deadlines are dictated by what's written in the contract. We'll talk about this later as well. If you do not meet your deadlines, 
you can find yourself in breach of contract. And if you're in breach of contract, you could actually be sued. If you cultivate a good relationship, a good working relationship with the client, well, you might have some leeway, assuming, of course, that you warn the client way ahead of time when things aren't going as well as it was expected that they would go. Communication is key though here. You cannot wait till the day before the deadline to tell the client that you're not gonna be able to meet the deadline. So how can you help mitigate some of these issues? Well, you want sound project management and schedule especially if you're juggling multiple projects. Know when each of the project's deadlines fall, so you can actually plan accordingly. There's a third source of stress, which can make or break a project. And that's the quality of team interactions. If you have a toxic team, well, you might make the deadlines and you might hand in a great project, but you're not going to want to do any more projects with these people. You need to treat your colleagues and your clients with respect at all times. Emails should be respectful. Water cooler conversations, meetings, progress reports. There's got to be respect. Sometimes that's quite difficult to do when your colleagues or your clients do not respect you. If at all possible, although I understand that sometimes it's not only difficult to do so, but it's impossible to do so, you need to be the bigger person. Keep your interactions very friendly and cordial. Look, the reality is that you're not going to like all of your teammates all the time. And you're not going to like the clients all the time either, but you're all pulling in the same direction. Your team leader and your team should be kept abreast of any developments or hurdles, anything which might actually affect the project management plan in a crucial manner. Right? And you don't do that just so the project management plan doesn't suffer. If you let your teammates know that you've encountered a hiccup, they might be able to offer suggestions as to how to go around the problem or solve the problem. You also need to be sure you respond to requests and emails in a timely manner, within reason. Short of you having told the client, say that you're on vacation and unable to, unavailable to respond over a certain window, you should try to respond within 24 hours. If only to say, I've, I've received your email, I'm going to take a look at it and I'll get back to you shortly. Sometimes the way our brains work will conspire against our ability to have great team interactions or to uh, do great quantitative work or great communications with the client. Cognitive biases, there's about 20 of them that I, I've gotten from a, a, a magazine article. I'm not going to talk about them here in the video. I'd like for you to read up on them. And eventually I might ask you to tell the class which ones of these biases you think you're likely to have a hard time with.